Okay, we're about 205 in Peeper, and we were talking about Vincent of Larinum, as he puts it, and he's concerned about the, um, the whole um, analogy of faith, and as I said, Peeper's not too crazy about this and kind of pushes against this, and Peeper and I have our issues on that. I would disagree with that. So we've covered that, I think, pretty carefully already, and I don't want to go much further on that. Um, then Peeper just keeps on going. So we're just going to flip pages here as fast as we can and get through Peeper and then see if we have some time to get into the CTCR document on inspiration, which is pretty straightforward. But um, I want to hit a high, few highlights from that if we have the time to do that. Um, so we go to page like 208 in Peeper. And we have him here. He's now very concerned about the, um, the enthusiasts who are trying to go beyond Scripture. Now, for Peeper, what he's really hitting here with enthusiasm is the sense of we're not content with what God has given us, and we want something else on our own terms, which is really a pretty good definition for enthusiasm because it fits um, Luther's own use. So enthusiasm, we often associate this with charismatics. You know, oh, with Pentecostals. And we, so we can think about, okay, enthusiasm is like this kind of a, a Pentecostalism. Fair enough. And there is that aspect. So you've got, you know, the Holy Spirit being swallowed, feathers and all, that kind of whole thing. That's true. But if that's what we do with enthusiasm, then we get confused of how Adam and Eve were enthusiasts. What, were they, I mean, they were speaking in tongues when they got the apple down or something? What? But that's not what's going on. So what we really mean by here is the sense of a um, rejection of God's revelation. And so the revelation that God has given is being rejected, and instead you're choosing your own avenue. I want my way. So I'm not content with what God has given. That's why Luther can say Adam and Eve were enthusiasts, because what were they doing? Rejecting what God had given, which was his sure word, don't eat from this fruit. And Adam and Eve say, we've got our own way, thank you very much. And so they go their way, and they reject God's revelation and go the, what they want. So that's why they are the original enthusiasts. And that's the wide definition that Peeper's operating with here when he's going to talk about all the enthusiasts when it comes to Scripture. Because Peeper's point is, if you're not content with what God has given you in scripture, you're an enthusiast. You're looking for stuff beyond that. So that's what he's kind of getting at here. So that's what he puts underneath here. The Reformed, all modern theologians, the Papists. See, these are all enthusiasts, as Peter sees it, because they're not content with just being scripture alone. And I get his point. So uh, footnote 20, or footnote on page 208, footnote 19 from Luther. This is against the heavenly prophets, which would be Luther's other kind of uh, aphorism for the enthusiasts, the heavenly prophets. So about halfway through that quote he writes, Do you not see the devil here, that enemy of divine order, how he gets you to gape by his shouting, The Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. And all the while he is tearing up the bridges, highway and byway, ladder, and everything by which the Spirit is really to come to you, namely the external ordinances of God in the material of baptism, written in oral word of God, and wants to teach you not how the Spirit will come to you, but how you should come to the Spirit. Ow! And that smell like printer just jumping off the pages at you? Okay, no, I, no idealism, caritas climbing up, but God coming down. So all these avenues, these bridges, these ladders, are not ladders and bridges for us to ascend, but for the Holy Spirit to come. And Luther's point is, if you start wiping out all the means, you are wiping out the very way that God comes to you with His grace. You're being a fool. What are you doing? And that's why he's so opposed to this enthusiasm, and that's what Peeper's getting at. Now, if you take what Peeper's arguing here and expand it to include baptism, Lord's Supper, proclamation, written text, cool. But Peeper's basically making his argument here, zeroing in on only one of those avenues, which would be the written text. That's what he's kind of zeroing in on. But it really applies much more widely than that. All right, <clears throat> good. All right. So... He says on page 210, kind of an odd thing, Peeper does, very top of the page, two lines in, there is no promise of such revelations. On the contrary, God has directed and bound all Christians to the last day, to the word of the apostles and prophets. With this word, the period of divine revelation is closed. So he's saying, basically, we're done. And yeah, perhaps. We have to be a little bit careful with this because we do hold to what we call an open canon. You guys probably have heard that somewhere along the way, and it's always kind of a surprise, and it really perplexes people, but in the light of everything I've been teaching you, this should make complete sense, doesn't it? So the idea of an open canon is, have we said, that's it, 66, no more ever? We don't believe that. We actually say, the canon is an open canon. So is it possible that someday there could be another book added to that? Yes. Yeah. Now maybe it would be something like Maccabees, 
even though unlikely because it hasn't gained universal acclaim yet and probably won't. But what if we've dug up or we opened up a cave somewhere in the in the in um, the ancient you know in the Near East and we discovered a papyrus that was written out to the Corinthians from Paul and it was the lost harsh letter and it has all the marks of a Pauline text. Everything we detest dates it out. It's right there. It's like crazy exciting. Now, would it be possible that we could say, there it is. It's a Pauline text. It's apostolic. And so what would happen? So would we immediately start publicizing and sticking it in between 1st and 2nd Corinthians? 1 1st Corinthians A or whatever? 1.2? Would we do that? Well, see, here's what would probably happen. People would start studying it and start reading it. And if they start reading it and saying, this is cool, this is Paul, this, this just resonates, and I'm finding this to be really helpful, and the church starts reading it more and more, and people start reading it, and they start, before you know it, someone's going to publish it and stick it in as an appendix to the Bible. And it'll kind of find its way in. And then a couple of daring pastors will maybe preach a sermon out of one of those texts. And another hundred years go by, and people are doing that kind of regularly. And it finds its way from being an appendix to actually kind of getting into the New Testament, in, 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 maybe behind 2 Corinthians. Before you know it, it's there. And then another couple hundred years, what's the church doing? Treating it like canon. Is it possible we could add a book? Yeah. And how would it happen? I think it would be something like that. And then finally, the Catholics would have a council and they declare it in. And we would all say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, in other words, how, how do you know it's the canon? How do you know it's really God's word? The church uses it, and the church, it confirms itself. It's self-authenticating, which is exactly the process the first time around in 82, 1, 2, 300. That's how it happened. So it's not like they all met and said, well, these books just kind of have this, you know, you put them under black light, and they give out this certain glow, so you know the Holy Spirit was involved. This one doesn't. That didn't happen. They just read them and used them and knew. Okay, Adam? Uh, without having read Maccabees or any of those other apocrypha, what's, what's wrong with, with mm -hmm. them? Not much. I mean, they just weren't, they're not as old. They come for the intertestinal time period. They don't have as much history behind them. And um, so they weren't used as widely. So then when the church picked them up, they weren't as in common use. So that's probably the main reason they dropped out. There's nothing really, uh, you know, bad or anything lacking in them necessarily. They're just nothing like theologically wrong. No, no. See, that's the thing. If they, if they were included, Nothing's going to change. And that was the point that Childs made when he said, you know, for a while the Geneva Bible had it in, then they took him out. Did, like, the theology change dramatically in Geneva? No. <laughs> you know, they came in and went out, and everything pretty much stays the same. And so, you know, you get this sometimes when people will say, well, the Catholics believe in purgatory because they have the Apocrypha. No, that is not why they believe in purgatory. They find a verse in the Apocrypha that which they kind of twist to make seem like it's helping, but it doesn't prove anything. It, I think so. I don't remember. I don't care that much. All right. Good. Now, so there we have the action, which I think I gave you last time, 210. This is the kind of the classic way of saying it. New revelations in regard to the Christian doctrine either coincide with the doctrine contained in Scripture and then are superfluous, or they offer something else that then is recorded in the Word of the Apostles and then are to be rejected. Well, that's right. So we're not looking for new revelation, but if somebody does find the lost letter to the Corinthians, I'm all in on that. But we'll, we'll have to just wait and see. Hasn't happened yet. Okay. Now, is it possible that you can have a revelation we talked about, about something in society or in the world around? And the peeper says, yes. So is it possible that God might reveal to you who's going to win the next, you know, the 20, what would it be, 20, 2020 election, that God could tell you who's going to win that? Possible. But so what? All right. So that's kind of the point here. All right. Good. Um, that's fine. Now, the problem comes in when we get to page 213 when Peter says, Holy Scripture is identical with the Word of God. And remember, I gave you my mathematical formula last time. And that's where, see, I would say, so you have the Bible here, and then we'll have God's Word here. And so what do we want to put between them? So Peter seems to want that and be content with this, which is fine, okay, as far as it goes. Because is the Bible entirely, completely the Word of God? We would say yes. We don't have to worry about this. And see, what we're really kind of fighting against is one of these phrases that was really popular um, in the middle 20th century and to the walkout time is that the Bible contains the Word of God. 
And so, and that's everybody is, whoa, all the red lights start to flash and everybody comes out, you know, comes unglued. What do you mean contains? Because if it only contains the Word of God, then you're at liberty to decide which parts are and which parts aren't, and off you go. And that's true, because it opens the floodgates. It's like a quitanus subscription to the, uh, to the Book of Concord. So I subscribe to the Book of Concord insofar as it's right. Well, that's no subscription. What's the point? And it's the same thing if the Bible contains the Word of God. We're not cool there at all. So the Bible is the Word of God exactly right. The problem comes with the reciprocity aspect. Because if the Bible is the Word of God, cool, but is the God's Word equal and completely exhausted in the Bible? And that's why I would say no. So that's why I want to have the greater than or equal to. So I'm sorry, going the wrong way. Get my arrow pointing to the smaller one. I learned this to the big end to the bigger one, right? Okay. So, so the God's Word is greater than or equal to the Bible, and I think that's the better way to look at this. But this is not to denigrate the Bible, it's to enhance all the ways that God's Word works. So what we're trying to include here is Word and Sacrament, which people would do, but also enhancing and not forgetting the Oral Word, and also not forgetting the whole idea of Christ being the Word, the personal Word. So we want to make sure we have that understood as well. All right, so we're all good here with this. Um, now, I wanted to say something about this, too, while I'm thinking about it. Prenter talks about the written text becoming the Word of God. That's usually also very alarming language, okay? So in other words, you mean it's not, but if the Spirit works in it, then it becomes? But what Prenter's trying to get at there, remember, is the idea of the living Word versus the kind of the dead Word. And the Holy Spirit has to be at work breathing life into this, or it's not happening. Now, what we would say is we're confident the Spirit is always at work when the Word is being read and proclaimed, so it is always a living, efficacious Word. But what Prenner's trying to emphasize is the need to be dependent upon the Spirit, and I think what Prenner's really after is he wants to make sure that we are keeping our foundation on faith and not on some kind of certain, there I got my theory all worked out, and these are the magic words, and that's my foundation. Prenner wants to resist that at any any way he can. And so that's why he pushes even further against that kind of stuff than even I would and says some stuff I wouldn't be comfortable saying, but Printer goes all whole hog and says it all. All right. That making sense? Okay. Good. So we got that. We're all fine here then. We can keep on moving along. Um, see, now they get to page 216 and you got this Gerhard quote. And so Gerhard is, you know, classic Lutheran high orthodoxy, um, and you can talk, call this the golden age of Lutheran orthodoxy, or you can call it um, Lutheran scholasticism, depending on how you tend to view that. Um, t t pick your terms that you like. I know which one I kind of like. All right, so we're on page 216, end of the first, the one only, only complete paragraph, and it, Gerhard writes, there is no real difference between God's Word and Holy Scripture. There is no real difference, but only a difference in expression between the two terms Holy Scripture says and God says. Holy Scripture and the Word of God are interchangeable terms. And see, now he's got them as synonyms, and I'm not content with that. I'm, I'm thinking he's, he's starting to tighten it down too much, and in his zeal to enhance the authority and certainty of the Scripture, he starts to leave out some of these other things, and that's what I'm a little concerned about. All right, now you also notice, though, so the next paragraph. We are at times apt to lose sight of this truth because the Holy Scriptures speak to us in such simple human terms and also dwell, especially in the OT, on such ordinary affairs of life as the household, agriculture, stock raising, clothes, food, etc. For this reason, Holy Scripture fares as did Christ in the days when he walked upon this earth. So, in other words, he's comparing the Bible to Jesus. Jesus looks too ordinary, nobody trusts him. The Bible looks too ordinary, nobody, nobody trusts him. But it's almost kind of weird that he's using the example of Jesus to substantiate why the Bible is cool. It's kind of like he's getting them kind of backwards, I think. But anyway. All right. So then we have a um, great Luther quote on the facing page, and that's fine. He talks about verbal inspiration next, and this is where the CTCR document picks up on this as well. So what we're saying by verbal inspiration, and let's just go to the CTCR document because the CTCR document does this probably better than Peeper does. So let's jump over to the CTCR right now. And this, so you read through this document. What would you guys think of this one? This is an oldie from, what, 75? Yeah. So what would you think of this document? Okay, pretty solid. This one's not bad. CTCR documents, as you will learn if you haven't yet, are a um, kind of a mixed bag. So, um, well, and we'll see that as we work our way through this quarter. Okay, we have a few more coming. I think most of them in this quarter are pretty solid. Um, but they, they can be a mixed bag. Always read them 
with your eyes wide open and kind of asking yourself, what's going on here? All right, now this one's pretty solid and pretty helpful. And think about the timing of this. So when does this one come out? Yeah, a year after the walkout. This is 75. Now, this, the opening words say they were already working on this and it was already happening. Yeah, it was. This was already becoming an issue. It was already starting to percolate. And so the walkout, which is February of 74, just precipitates this. And now it comes out March 75. So this is what, where it's going on. Now, the document is overall, I think, pretty helpful and also kind of nuanced because they're still trying at this point to try to find some kind of common ground with some of these more you know, free-thinking academics who they're having trouble with. And so that's why I think this document tends to be much more careful in its language than the paper does, for example. And I, that's why I think the document is actually more on track. Now, they first then they make a distinction, which is, I think, quite helpful, between inspiration and revelation. And this is just getting your vocab right and knowing what you're talking about and using the right words. So what do we mean by inspiration? Both of these words, are we're talking purely in the context of doctrine. When it comes to doctrine, what we're, what, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about you know, definitions in general, but doctrinal definitions, what do we have in mind? So what do we mean? So what is inspiration? Inspiration is simply translating theopneustus. Right? Which, Greek for? God breathed. Okay, God breathed, theopneustus, this is the word that we get. All scripture is theopneustus, profitable for, this is the Timothy text. Okay, theopneustus, it's God breathed. And so we get from Greek theopneustus to inspiration, same thing only in Latin, because spire is to breathe in. Okay, so inspire is to breathe in. So we're getting the same thing. We could have said probably Deo Inspiratus, but it's the same idea. So inspiration, Theopneustus, God breathed. We're talking about God directing the writing. Revelation is an, coming from the idea of the apoc, apocalypsis, okay? Or an unveiling. So this is the to, re, to unveil something, to uncover something. So when you Pull back the sheet and reveal the new car. That's the apocalypsis. Whoa! Okay, the unveiling. And so that's what we're talking about here is the idea of revelation. So revelation is, oh, didn't know that before. All right. Now, there's, so they're different. And we often use them interchangeably, but they're different. So this is why the CTCR document says the whole Bible is inspired, but not the whole Bible is re revealed. Because not everything that the biblical writers wrote had to be revealed. Some of it, they just knew. For example, did it have to be revealed to Paul that he left his cloak and wanted somebody to bring it with them when they came? Oh, thank you for revealing that spirit. I didn't know that. No. Did it have to be revealed to him? I don't think I baptized anybody except for maybe the household of Stephanus. Oh yeah, someone else, but I don't think it was anybody else. Does someone have to reveal that to Paul? Does the Holy Spirit reveal that? No, he just knows this. So we can even kind of maybe do it this way. We can think about, we'll do a, our, our Venn diagram here. So we'll have Scripture. And we'll put Scripture like that. So Scripture is, by definition, inspired. And so the whole thing is inspired. All of it would be inspired. But we also then have Revelation. And I'm going to put Revelation actually even bigger than the Bible. Because Revelation is something that God discloses to me. So is it possible that God would disclose something that doesn't end up in the Bible? Yeah. So you can have God revealing things that don't end up in the Bible, but you can also have parts of the Bible that aren't revealed but are still inspired. Okay, so you get the idea of the overlap. So this is my, my Venn diagram, very helpful, which I learned in about fifth grade. So, like wonderful grade school education in Oxford, Nebraska is paying off in spades. All right, so that's where we get here with this. Um, now, I would take issue with a few points here in the CTCR document. So I'm, you know, um, I don't have page numbers because I just downloaded this because I was making it easy for myself instead of running home and getting something. So it's point A, the very last line, last couple lines of point A, at the beginning of the document. They write, apart from the inspired scriptures, we have no other revelation of God, of his will, and of his redemptive acts in human history, which can make us wise into salvation. And I'd say, no, 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 I'm not sure if I'm ready to buy that. I would say, 
yes, ordinarily we have this, but if we didn't have the scriptures, would we still have the proclamation of Christ? We would. And see, you don't even have to go back to the time of Paul. You can think about even somebody who is like imprisoned and they have no scriptures. Does their faith die because they have no scripture? And if they even are like, suppose we get marooned on a desert island and nobody has a text, but you have Christians there, are they going to be able to maintain the faith in that place? I would say yes. Even if generations would go by, if they're carefully articulating and teaching, they would do this. And probably before too long, they would start writing down some of the key points and doing this. You know, that's how it would happen. That quote is on, it's in the part A, on the very beginning of it, right before point B, which is inspiration and sources. Right before inspiration and sources is where it shows up. Early in the document. Apart from the inspired scriptures. We have no external whatever. All right, good. Now, just keep on working through the CTSR document quickly. The next point they bring up, which I think is kind of helpful, well, this is interesting. So now I'm at um, in the very last lines of part C, letter C, right before inspiration and writers of biblical literature, which is part D. Okay, so I'm right at the beginning of part D. The biblical data do not warrant limiting inspiration to prophetic and apostolic oral proclamation. Prophets and apostles spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, also when they were writing the biblical books, that's true, in which God has preserved their message for all times to be the foundation on which the church is built. Then we have Ephesians 2.20 quoted, which Peeper is fond of quoting. But now let's look at Ephesians 2.20 and see what Paul actually wrote. So Paul actually writes in Ephesians 2.20, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, if I'm built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, does that equal written text? It, it doesn't. I mean, it's getting, they're making a kind of a, a jump immediately, but it's, in a, it's, a, it's a presumption or an assumption that, well, obviously that's what they mean, but that's not what Paul says. And you can have the foundation of the apostles would be the foundation is already there when Peter's preaching on Pentecost and when Stephen's testifying to the Sanhedrin. Is that the foundation of the apostles? I would say it is. And so it's already in place. So I think it's, this happens a lot where we just are in, we're in such a lockstep assumption. Word of God, Bible. Word of God, Bible. Word of God, Bible. It just happens. It's just like that. And they don't even have to think. And that's kind of what's going on here as well. Now, next part is quite nice. Part D inspiration in the writers of biblical literature, and the document here stresses, which is quite right, that the style of the writers come through. And this is simply explained perfectly if you just go back to what I kind of gave you before of thinking about Christ and his true nature, because he is fully human and he is fully divine both at once. And when we keep that in mind, we keep our Christology straight, and when we think about the Word of God as the Bible, the same thing holds. And, as a preview to fourth year, the same thing holds when we start talking about Christ's church. It's kind of cool, because the church is the body of Christ. So the church is fully human and fully divine. So it's got real people in it, and they're really annoying at times, and really troubling at times. But are they the church? Yeah, and they're not just some shadow of the church. They're not just some reflection of the church. They're the church. And there's not like some invisible church that's more real than they are. No, they're the real church. Just like Jesus in his humanity, is he really the Christ? Or no, he's just a shadow of the Christ. The real Christ is the divine, right? Jump on that. That's heresy, people. Come on. Prove, you know, let's be, all right, yeah, good, thank you. No, it's wrong. He's... The humanity is the real Christ. So now the Bible. Is the Bible fully human and fully divine? Yes, it is. It's both at once. It's absolutely human. It's absolutely divine. Both at once. And we can't go slicing them apart and say, well, the human's not really the, the thing. The divine's the real part. No, they're both real. And so that's why even when you teach a Bible class, you can say things like, well, now here, Paul makes kind of an interesting argument. And if somebody says, don't you mean the Holy Spirit? <sighs> And that's when you just smile and say, oh, you're right, yes, the Holy Spirit's behind this, it's inspired. And yet, is it Paul's argument? Yeah, of course, of course. And you can talk that way. And, so, and this, is what, this, is what, this is what is being acknowledged here, their styles come through. And you can tell this, even in English, when you start getting used to your Bible and reading it enough, Paul and John are just worlds apart, altogether different. 
not even just in grammar, but in vocabulary, but just even how they approach things and how they tell things. You just tell, and you can just get it. And that's kind of what's going on here. So there are differences that come through. All right, good. So then we also have all the different literary forms being acknowledged, which is quite right. And this is so important also. And see, this is also one of these things that grows out of keeping things straight so you don't become a biblicist. Because if you have a kind of a biblicistic attitude, then you think all the verses of Scripture are exactly the same because they're all the Word of God, and it's this kind of magic book that drops down, and that's why you even get the versification, where you just have verse, 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 the way the KJV used to be. You don't have any attempt to put in things into blocks or, you know, chunks of paragraphs. It's just independent, discrete verses, because all that matters is the magic verse, some kind of list of verses. And then what happens is you start ending up reading things like Psalms and Isaiah and John and Romans and Revelation like they're all the same. And you just read them at face value. You know, I just take it at face value. So you read in Revelation about the beast coming up out of the water, and so you're on the lookout. You know, when's that going to happen? And, and you, know, you read about the mark of the beast on the forehead, 666, and you start watching your old Omen movies, and you're pushing the kid's hair back, looking for 666. You know, it's just weird. But people think, well, that's really trust in the Bible, because you're reading it right. And it's, it's bizarre, because we know better, but yet we don't know when to kind of draw the lines. So the point the CTCR document is making, quite rightly, is you've got to know what you're reading to interpret it rightly, so you've got to pay attention. It's not all the same. Job and Psalms aren't the same as John and Paul or of Revelation. Apocalyptic literature is not Psalms, and it's not the poetry of, the, of Job. You've got to pay attention to your genre. It matters. Otherwise, you're just being a lousy interpreter. So I, I would agree with that. All right. Now, they also do a nice job in here on why it's inerrant, and they make the case it's not. This is at the very beginning of Section A under Part 2. So I'm under Roman numeral 2, Part A inspiration and inerrancy, and they write off the bat, they say this, even though there are differences in variety in the sacred writings which sometimes perplex us because we can find no harmonization for them, that satisfies human reason, faith confesses the Bible to be the inerrant word of God. Scriptures, since the inerrancy of scriptures is a matter of faith, it is by definition of doctrine which is believed solely on the basis of the witness of the scriptures concerning themselves, not on the basis of empirical verification. And I would say, not even just because of the witness of the scriptures concerning themselves, but also the witness of Christ. Okay? That's what I would also say, the witness of Christ. And so then they start getting into all their subpoints making this. This is, the, this is the key thing, though. You see, we don't conclude the Bible is inerrant because we have done scientific study of the text and it proves itself. That's, that's missing the point. That's, that's a rationalist, foundationalist kind of argument, and it's not the best way to go. All right. Good. Got that. All right. Good. All right. I can live with that, too. Go ahead, Coleman. Just a question back to the human divine part of that. Does that also spill over into the actual proclamation on Sunday morning? Yes, it does. And in terms of the sacraments themselves, how it Yeah, obviously it does. Called, what's the human? I mean, I realize you don't, water is not human, but is it? Do we it's creaturely. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's material. It's bound to this creation. And so the water is just plain old water. And, oh, it just came out of the tap. Yep, fine. You don't need holy water. That's the whole point. It's just ordinary stuff, and God couples the ordinary stuff. So then you get in the pulpit to preach, and you're just a dude with your ideas. And so you tell homey stories about how cute your kids are and make concocted spiritual applications out of it. Um, now, is, uh, is that your own silly idea? Yeah. But is it God's word? Yeah. Because when you preach, it's God's word to those people. So it kind of burdens you with making sure you're not being an idiot up there. Because um, you're, you're implicating the Holy Spirit in everything you do. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I know. I'm just adding to your burden a little more. <laughs> which I'm happy to do. Um, but the, the point is this. Yeah, it's utterly human, but it's utterly the word of God. So, yeah, he just told a story about his, his childhood. That can't be the word of God. Well, no, it is. It's, he's, cause he's conveying God's truth by this. And this is God's word for you today. Even though it doesn't look like it, it is. And this is also why it's important, and we hit this in Lutheran mind, that when you have the old, the old um, phrase, standard in a lot of the preaching would be, having heard the word of God, let's now make confession of our faith. Well, what's the word of God we're referring to? The sermon just delivered, not the scripture readings 20 minutes ago. It's the sermon just preached. That's the word of God. Yeah, so it's the same thing. Yeah, that's kind of cool when you think about it.
And what, and why, what I like about it is the, the continuity you see with the Christological emphasis in all this. If Christ is truly human and truly man, this is uh, truly God and truly, truly human, this is what percolates down through it all. So Christ's body, church is that way. Christ's preaching, yeah, it's that way. Christ's Bible, yeah, it's that way. Kind of cool. Brian? Uh, and don't we see that in, in like how Jesus uh, spread his ministry? He uh, not only interacted with earthly people, but he was himself a human and spoke uh, yeah. with his personality. Yeah. yeah. Comes through. Kind of a cool personality. Yeah. Julian. I'm just wondering about, so our practice, you know, for usually the readings, we stand for the gospel, sit for the sermon. Would it be heretical then to stand for the sermon? <laughs> well, <laughs> they fall over. Well, Most of it would be not very expedient. Well, no, I know it wouldn't be, but I mean, would we, were we to honor the sermon in such a high regard as we did the gospel? Well, you know, in Luther's day, it stood for the whole thing, so, you know, our, we just have pews because it's nice. And... So I, I, don't, I wouldn't read too much into that. But the idea is to treat the whole thing with the honor. And this is why Luther, he, he comes down pretty hard. You know, the way that you dishonor the word of God is by not going to church and not listening to the, the sermon. So if you're falling asleep during the sermon, you are breaking the second commandment. You're dishonoring the name of God. That, Luther's clear on that. And so he elevates clearly to proclaim the sermon. It's, it's significant. And if you're not honoring the sermon, you're not honoring God because that's where God is speaking to you. He's pretty clear on that. All right. <clears throat> Good? All right, let's fly forward. I think there's just a couple more things I wanted to hit in here. Section 3, Roman numeral 3, Inspiration and Biblical Authority. This is pretty good. This section is also on track. Inspiration and the unity of Scripture. First point, the unity of the Scriptures is Christological. That's what Charles was telling us, right? The whole thing, what's holding it all together? It's all about Christ. And this is what Jesus himself said. Scriptures testify to me. It's about me. And this is why Luther was so clear. Everything is about Christ. And that's the, that's the kind of criteria then for canonicity. Does it point to Christ? So then right before, about two paragraphs in, he has his next point, which is the unity of the Scriptures is doctrinal. But just before that, the end of the paragraph previous, he writes, or the document writes, Nevertheless, there are in the Scriptures no conflicting and contradictory conceptions of God and His ways with men. God is consistent. And that's, that's quite right. So God is consistent from His creation, through Israel, through the redemption of Israel, through sending of Christ, through the life of the church, and through His promise fulfillment. He's consistent all the way through. And you see Him always operating the same way with His people. I agree with that. So then the unity of the Scriptures is doctrinal, and we use the Scriptures to interpret Scriptures, and we see the consistency. And this is really a nod to what we would call nowadays biblical theology. And this is trying to push against this kind of proof text idea of just cherry-picking verses and pulling them out of context and instead saying, what's going on at the whole of Scripture, what are these, how these verses fit, and that's, that's important. All right, in the last section, um, point B, inspiration and the authority of Scriptures, and this is quite nice. They're talking about the authority of Scriptures is twofold, and Scripture then has authority in the church. And this was a big issue back in the 70s. That's why they're spending so much time on this. And it has a twofold authority. One is causative in that it creates faith. So that's, that's the easy one. So it creates faith. It causes faith to happen. Okay, good. But then it also has a second kind of authority, and that's the normative authority. And so does it guide and shape and direct our teaching? Yes, it does. And so it regulates doctrine. It does both of these. And that was the thing that sometimes people would push against because, well, you know, we've got to maybe be a little bit more careful with our sources of our doctrine. But it's both of these things. It's both causative and normative, and you don't pick and choose between them. They both work together. The last phrase we need to get from the CTCR document, then, is this whole idea of efficacy. And efficacy is another thing altogether different than revelation or inspiration. Because the scriptures are inspired... And because then the Holy Spirit is at work in them in a present way, they are efficacious. They have efficacy. In other words, they do stuff. They are performative. You remember that language from Lutheran mind. They do things. So this is the old language you would use that's efficacious. So when the Spirit's working, it is efficacious. So if the Word is proclaimed, the Spirit is at work through that proclamation, it's efficacious. People can come to faith. People can be killed and made alive. Stuff's happening when this goes on. And 
it, it is working. So it's efficacious. This gets back to what I was telling you a little bit about, or kind of hinting where we're going with the sacraments, the difference between efficacy and benefit. So the scripture is always efficacious because the spirit is at work, killing and making alive. It will be beneficial when the person comes to repentance and actually relents and receives the gift. But it's efficacious because this is God at work in this. And that's a different kind of a thing than inspiration. Inspiration is getting at more of the provenance, the origin of the Bible. Efficacy is its continued live action in the lives of people down to this day. It's always efficacious right down to the present. So that would, be, that would be the divine efficacy. Bless you, Coleman. Not to call attention to you or anything. All right, so the very um, end of section B, they, the second to last paragraph, it wraps up by saying, inspiration explains how we got the scriptures. Authority explains why we ought to and do believe the scriptures. And I think that's quite right. That's what's going on here. Then they have a section wrapping it up here about canonicity. And I think they're on the right track here where they basically say that the sacred writers, the sacred scriptures authenticate themselves. It's not like the Bible, the church got together and picked the books they liked, but they did. <laughs> in fact, you know, they did get together and chose what was in the canon. But on what basis? It wasn't because, you know, 51% like this, okay, it's in. No, it's because everybody said this one proves itself. Yes, it does. It's in. And so that's why it comes in. And for a while, there were some that were spoken against. Remember the term anti-legomena? Remember that one? You should know that term as well, okay? Some of these terms you just need to know. <clears throat> so the anti-legomena were the texts that were spoken against early on, like Hebrews, Second Peter, Revelation, all of which have found their way in, but they were spoken against for a while. Then you have the homologumena, which were what? Homo legumina, where everything's cool, they're in, no problem. So we're all in agreement. Homo legumina, we're, we're all the same. We all think the same about this, no problem. So the homo, homo legumina were like Romans, um, Mark, Luke, no problem there. These are in. So that's the homo legumina. Anti legumina, there's some problem. And then we have another one I'll put up here for you too, because you should know that one as well, even though it didn't come in today, which is pseudepigrapha. You should have encountered all this terminology in an exegetical course somewhere. But pseudepigrapha means what? Literally means false writing. Okay, pseudo. So it's a false writing. So pseudepigrapha. And these are the things that we're trying to be um, kind of passed off as legitimate things. And these were common. And you would say, wow, this is the third revelation to Paul to the um, Ephesians. And then you would write this crazy document and try to pass it off as Pauline. That's why it was pseudepigrapha. Okay, and this is not uncommon. Pseudepigrapha, always out, no question at all. Antilogomena is kind of, eh, a little iffy. Homologumena, no problem, in like Flynn. Then the antilogumena, eventually, most of them find their way into becoming canonical. And the CTCR document makes the point, you know, there would have been a time when we can be distinguished between the antilogomena and the homologumena. Maybe we don't need to worry about it so much anymore, and that's probably true. Nobody really pays much attention if you're quoting from 3 John or from you know, Romans or from Second Peter, most for the most part. Now, for my part, I will never, ever, ever treat as doctrinally veracity, anything with doctrinal substance or even preach out of the, that last part of Mark. I just, I just won't. In my opinion, it doesn't cut it. And so I, I end Mark at verse 8, period. I won't preach past it. Um, and I'm also pretty wary of Second Peter, but um, we don't need to talk about that too much. So I, I have not preached out of Second Peter. I don't intend to. And I won't. I won't teach in a Bible class either. What's that? Hebrews is cool. Uh, <laughs> Hebrews is fine, even though it was anti-legomena. But see, there's different reasons for why it's anti-legomena. For Hebrews, the only reason it was being held back was just the question of. Uh, 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 authorship. That was the issue. And that's why you just, they weren't sure. And that's why they were hesitant about that. It wasn't the content. But with um, Second Peter and with um, End of Mark, it's more than just authorship. It's just like, whoa, these things just, especially this End of Mark, it's so obviously not consistent with Mark and authorship. Now, is it okay to use it? And can we quote from it? Yeah, I get it. I'm just, for me, it's a matter of kind of principle. So that's how I do it. And see, in the Second Peter too, Second Peter just like, it's so different than First Peter. And people will make the argument, same authorship, but I have not been convinced by that argument, just myself personally. Coleman. In as much as we have an open canon to add to, could stuff slip out? Well, yeah, exactly. So in other words, like, you know, somebody, 
you know, does more scholarship and more and more scholarship, and Second Peter becomes more and more questionable. It could slip out. And already, the end of Mark is becoming that way in, in our lifetime. Because, you know, when it used to be you just published Mark, ended up wherever, verse 20, whatever it is, all the way through, you know. So, boom, no question. And then, you know, the scholarship starts to improve more and more, and then it starts to be in an asterisk. And then they start setting it off in italics, like some of the translations. And some now have almost like a red flag. With, you know, read this footnote first. This is probably not there. And you start, whoa. And so eventually it's going to end up becoming a footnote itself, is my opinion. And then it's probably, you know, just become nothing more than a blip. Because it's already kind of working its way out of the canon. Sort of like with um, the woman taking an adultery, too. Great story. Probably true, but probably not original. Go ahead. Particularly with Mark, with that ending, how does that affect like, Luther cites it? Yeah, it's not a big deal because you can find other places to support everything he wants to say there. And you don't need those verses to do it. In fact, some of the others do it better. And my, my whole argument, this is an ex- exegetical thing, but I, and I learned this in a Veltz class somewhere. But if you end Mark at verse 8, it's really cool. I mean, it like just cinches the whole gospel. It's like perfect. And when you tack on all of this stuff, it just ruins the whole thing. So for me, it's a no-brainer. That's the ending. And that's exactly where Mark intended to end it. He's done. And they were afraid. Perfect. Amen. Done. Awesome. <laughs> I, you just got to love it. Because in the context of what the gospel is trying to do, it's just, poof, it's right there. It's really cool. So that's why I'm kind of anti-end of Mark. Long ending. Yeah. At what, what point would you be going against what the rest of the church is doing if these books get in there because the church is using them? Yeah. And see, that's why, you know, I'm not going to be loud and complaining about this and screaming about it. I don't tell everybody in my congregation, tear out Second Peter, you know. But just my own practice, I'll, I'll use them or not use them. And so I will, you know, I'll go along. The church has decided these are pretty cool. All right, fine. You know, I can deal with that. But there were some of the reasons why the church decided they were pretty cool is because Texas Receptus and other things that maybe aren't so compelling when you start to learn more about the history of transmission of the text. All right. Okay? Good? Anything else with the CTCR document? So, back to people, and we should be able to flip pages really quickly now, because we already covered most of what you're going to get into. So we got inspiration, got that, and um, good, 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 good. And then he summarizes some things here. Yeah, okay, that's fine too. So then we get to page 228, relation of the Holy Ghost to the Holy Writers. And what Peter is stressing here is quite right, and this is also in the CTCR document, we do not believe in this kind of dictation idea. And this is kind of, and this sometimes gets called the Amontanist doctrine. Oh, my pen's starting to go. So, Montanism, remember, was one of these ancient heresies. And the Montanists tended to be kind of like these enthusiasts. They were a little bit of the early church Pentecostals, in a sense. That's what the Montanists were. They were really into their visions and, you know, these you know, ecstatic experiences. The Montanist idea, and this is, shows up in other places as well, is this sort of dictation thing. So, the, so here's Matthew sitting, you know, just writing his, his recollections about Jesus, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit mm, came on him, and Matthew goes, mm, and he becomes, mm, you know, he's like staring straight ahead and just writing, because the Holy Spirit takes his hand, and so it's like the very dictation, or the Holy Spirit's whispering in his ear, and Matthew says, okay, now I missed that last word, say it again, you know, and so that, that's, that's the idea, and we reject this, and Peter's right about this, we reject this, because the writers are writing from their own experience and from their own ability and from their own recollections. That's why Paul can say, don't remember if I baptized anybody else. Maybe I did. I don't remember for sure. And that's why Mark can stick in, and there was a young man there, and he fled away naked because he left his garment when he was scared in the Garden of Gethsemane. What's that there for? Well, Mark put his little personal thing in there. Kind of cool, Mark. Thanks for that. I like that. But um, what's the big theological import? Well, we built a sermon out of that, you know. I'm sure you could, but, um, you know, he fled naked. Oh, okay, that's an endorsement of streaking. But, um, you, it's, you see, that's, that's proof texting for you. There you go. But it's, 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 the, it's the mark of the individual writer, which is really cool. And, and Peeper's got this right. Um, so on page 230, and this is well said, this is the... Um, First full paragraph, four lines in. For God did not first kill or dehumanize Isaiah, David, and all the prophets in order to speak or write through them, but he carefully preserved their lives and their genuine human way of expressing themselves in order that they might in their speaking be understood by men. 
And precisely this and only this was most definitely taught and set forth by the church fathers and old dogmaticians when they spoke of amanuenses, kalami, etc. Okay, and we have another word here than this amanuensis, which you should know that one as well. Which means what? Yeah, scribe. This is kind of a cool word because if you, if you look for the Latin root in there, you see manus, which is the Latin word for hand. Okay? For manual labor is hand labor. So amanuensis is literally my hand. It's kind of cool. So when Paul was dictating, he had an amanuensis who was his hand who took the dictation and cranked it out. And there you have it. So the amanuensis was the hand that was used. So the hand is, is a live thing. And even Paul's hand is the live part of this. And that's what's kind of getting at here. But that word amanuensis, is, you should be aware, familiar with that one as well. All right, so we reject the Montanists, as it says on page 231. Yeah, I did get it right. Okay. All right, and because of this idea of kind of holy trance, no, we don't believe in that. Okay. All right. Now, Pieper says some really weird things sometimes. And on page 233, he, he says something that's just kind of weird. But I, maybe 100 years ago, you could say this, and no one would bat an eyelash. But about five lines in, he starts writing on 233. None of us, even though, did you guys already note this one? None of us, even though he were a doctor in all four of the learned professions, can deny the inspiration of Holy Scripture without suffering an impairment of his natural mental powers. <laughs> <laughs> what are the four professions? Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. Medicine, theology, um, law. yeah, law, you're right. And then maybe astronomy, I think, was originally. Yeah, I think it was something like that. I think it was, I think it was astrology, law, medicine, theology, I think were the four. I could be wrong about that, but I think so. Um, so, but anyway, the, the four learned is not the big deal. The point is that if you deny the inspiration of Holy Scripture, you're going to suffer an impairment of your natural mental powers, which means when you go see a doctor, the first thing you should always ask him is, do you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God? I'm being facetious now. I'm very naughty. Um, but it's just, come on, Peeper. And see, what, what he is, he's kind of missing here is the whole idea of first article gifts and the whole idea of God at work in the first article world. And he's, he's missing that, which is a common thread throughout a lot of this. And it's kind of this privileging of the spiritual over the physical. And we, we shouldn't operate that way. Luther wouldn't have operated that way, but that's, he's, he makes the comment, and it's just kind of strange. And this, this is percolated down. I had, I still remember this, a professor I had when I was a student here, and this was in a different department as an exegetical professor, and he would come to class, and he would just rail on the liberal critics, and he would just laugh at them like they were just stupid. And his, his assumption was, if you're a liberal, you're a stupid. You know, why would you believe this? You're just stupid. It's just stupid. And it's like, dude, they might be wrong, but they're not stupid. You know, they can be rather brilliant intellectually and probably could run circles around you in a debate, but they're, they can still be wrong. And so wrong does not equal stupid. And we have to be careful about this. So in other words, someone can be quite brilliant and make sharp, brilliant arguments, but still be wrong spiritually. And we need to recognize that. And Pieper's a little bit reluctant with that. It's kind of like if you're denying God, well, then you're an idiot. And it's just not that way. So we need to be, I think, a little more sensitive to those kinds of things. It's a little bit of a theology of glory. Yeah, it does start to smack of that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it's like we got it all right and we're cool. Yeah, it smells a little glory-like to me, too. All right, now, page 237, he starts getting into here a little bit on the, um, the variant readings. And do we have a couple of variant readings? <laughs> yeah. And you guys have been through your exegetical courses. You've got your Nestle Allen text in front of you. And it's also interesting that Peter kind of disparages that later on in the text. He's a big fan, fan of the Textus Receptus, which now is kind of like, come on. But that's kind of how he's operating. And so that shows you also a little bit of where he's, he's coming at with this. And so we have variant readings. And this is where we start getting into, again, a little bit of this whole lively debate that's been happening in the Senate over the last few years, which keeps on getting prolonged by certain journals in our quasi-synod. Um, <clears throat> and this is the whole question of the source of the text. I don't know if this ever makes it on the camera or not, but I'm going to go over here anyway. Um, <clears throat> so we have the issue of the autographs. And so what we often say is the autographs, of course, would mean what? When we're talking doctrinally, what are we talking about? The original text, and this is autograph means from Paul's hand. 
or from the hand of the amanuensis. Okay? So these would be the original text. And what we like to say is that the autographs were inspired and inerrant because they are the autographs. And then what we say, of course, is now through textual you know, variants, you can have some shifting around here. Okay? And so we have lots of variants. And so then the question starts to become, so if we have all of these variants for any given text, which one's the autograph? How do we know? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the reason this becomes an issue, and you need to get beyond the simple, well, do you believe that this is the actual autograph or not, and then kind of debating these things. Think about what everything I've been telling you about, your biblicist kind of mentality, your foundationalist, rationalist mentality. If you're hanging on to one little last shred of kind of a rationalist, biblicist mentality, you go to the autographs. Because even though I can't say that the text I have in front of me, you know, yes, this is the Word of God, but wait a minute, there are some slight variants here. We have some slight variants. Is it, you know, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, like the RSV, or like the authorized text has, Texas Receptus, or is it peace on earth, goodwill, or peace to men of goodwill, of God's favor? Which one is it? Wow, it's a subtle, subtle difference. Well, that's a difference. So which one is it? And now, if I am a biblicist, that's a problem. I want to know which one it is, and I got to know. And so I can make the move of saying KJV. Now, if I'm not stupid enough to go there, I'll say, well, no, it's not the KJV, but it's the autograph. That's the certain thing. Now we're cool again. Now we got the autograph. But see, here's the can of worms that Cloa opens up. And he points out, based on research and study, that how would we even know if the autograph if we found it? And if we were holding the original papyrus that Paul's amanuensis had written, how would we know? Because the last couple words would actually be a different hand, like Paul said, here in my own hand I write, ooh, there it is. Then we'd know. And then you have the further problem, which Kolo points out. In fact, often when these letters are written, especially when they were significant towards Paul's later career, there would be probably a number of amanuensis writing at the same time. And so Paul's dictating, and everybody's writing it down, and you got six of them, and they get done, they compare, make some checks, corrects a few things. So now, which one's the real text? What if one of them still slips through with a slight variation in spelling, or a mishearing of a word, or a collapsing of a couple words? Which one's really the text? And now, the answer I would say is, who cares? It's not a big deal. But if I'm still a rationalist, I care, because I need to have a certain sure text, and I'm going to try to figure out what that is. And that's kind of what Clo was saying is, we don't really know. That's why he coined this term of, or he used this term of a plastic text, which everybody goes bonkers over. But what he's getting at is, it's variable. It's kind of a lively thing, and, and this, it's, it's all in here. Now, Pieper makes the point, and there's the big takeaway, which is what you tell your people. Even with thousands of variant readings, which one of those variant readings challenges or, or puts theology or doctrine into question? Not one. Not one. Even if you whack off the end of Mark, what do you lose? Nothing. Nothing. Okay? Even if you chuck Second Peter, what do you lose? Nothing. Except that weird thing about descending to hell, which we could do without anyway. But um, <laughs> that's the only place. He went and preached to the spirits in prison, whatever that's about. And so we, you don't lose any doctrine. And even that doctrine is, is fine. So you don't lose anything by acknowledging the textual variance. It's, it's all right. And the, the key thing is we trust God's provision of a text just like we trust God's provision of our faith. And we're confident of the text and we believe this. That's one of the reasons why you can make a case for the text as receptus. But see, I think you can also make a case for the text as we have it in English are good. And this is, see, and here's another implication of all this. You don't have to get so hung up on which translation your people are using. And some people get all worked up like, well, that translation's not acceptable. It's a bad translation. It's a translation. It's a translation of text. And some of them maybe are better than others, but they have different purposes, frankly. And I've become much more easy about this. And if I got people who are actually reading their text, I'll take it. And I, you know, there's a guy in my congregation for my, vac my vacancy church, my home church, who um, reads the Living Bible all the time for crying out loud. Ugh. And, um, you know, but he just loves his Living Bible. And he's you know, quoting to me from his Living Bible sometimes. And I'll, and I'll just say, dude, that's not the Bible. But if you're reading it, you know, it's fine. You know, I'm glad it's working for you and you're, he enjoys it. 
All right. And so, I, so in other words, different translations have, bring different elements. And it's not all bad. It's, it's okay. It's not like we have to have one text to make sure we're all on the same page together. It's cool. This is God's Word. And He speaks through different translations. And even the variants will sometimes shed light on things for us. It's cool. So what comes through? God's Word comes through. And we're confident of that. All right. Yeah. The, especially within the laity of the Senate, the, mm. the misunderstanding of textual variants. I've had lifelong Lutherans who I looked up to and thought, oh, wow, you're, you really know your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, oh, no, they've got the, the autographs in archives over at the Vatican. Yeah. They know exactly what they're I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, Luke. It's like they're confident somewhere they're locked up in a safe, and, and we just get them out sometimes to check. You know, it's there, and, and, the, and that reveals just a complete, you know, rationalistic kind of idea. You're right, it's, it's, it's pretty common. Yeah, Indiana Jones kind of thing, yeah. He knows where they are, yeah. You, you made the statement, God's word comes through. And yeah. That sounds, again, like... Sounds like Prender, doesn't it? Or, or God's word is contained in the Bible. It's, make- it's a dynamic thing. It's God's living word. The Holy Spirit makes it alive. But are these words on this page, in black and white, the word of God? You bet they are. And are they efficacious? Yes, they are. No doubt about it. And yet, as we're reading them and studying them, they become alive in me because the Holy Spirit makes them alive. And so the word of God comes through. And that's why, like I said, I'm trying to get across, you don't need to get quite so hung up on how you're translating that one word or, you know, which, which translation are you using? You know, using the NIV, ooh, you know. I, we don't need to be quite that hung up on these kinds of things. Okay? All right. Good. Good, 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 good. Um, so, then why do we believe this? And Peeper's quite right here. Page 238, we, we confess the confidence we have in our text a priori and this is quite right remember your latin this is just a standard latin term a priori means from before a priori so we know this a priori we know it from before and we're sure of it because this tells us what we have it before we even approach a text so before i even open my bible what is my assumption because of my faith in christ this is the word of god given to me with confidence by God himself through his prophets, through his chosen apostles. This is his word to me. It proclaims Christ. It points to Christ. I know Christ. He has claimed to me. I trust his word and the word about him. So that's why I'm sure of it. So I don't even have to open my Bible yet. And that's why the whole idea of, you know, the scientific study of the text itself will prove it. It's not the point. Now, people also says a posteriori, which would mean after the fact, so after the fact, we can also come to these conclusions that, yeah, on the basis of scientific investigation. Well, all right. So we can study the text and we say, look, there are these prophecies in the OT. They're fulfilled in the New T. That's pretty cool. And we see a consistency in the scriptures. That's pretty cool. And we see how even Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, with four very different accounts and sometimes conflicting accounts of the resurrection and passion, all can be harmonized and point to a common story that's pretty cool. So all this stuff is corroborating and encouraging, and it's great. And that's the a posteriori. Now, what I would argue is the a posteriori, a posteriori confirms rather than establishes. So the, we establish the Scripture's position a priori based on faith. But then the a posteriori experience we have of using the Scriptures confirms it. And this is also played out even in your own personal experiential life. So you start putting some proverbs into action. You know, like a gentle word turns away anger. So you start, I think I'll do that. It works. Whoa, this Bible is pretty cool. You know, and so that's kind of that, again, it confirms it. It confirms the truth of these things. You know, cast your cares on him for he cares for you. So you start praying and trusting God and you realize you find more joy and more freedom in your life. Huh, these things work. Sounds like a schwerm right. No, it sounds like living the Christian life, and this is an a posteriori confirmation of the truth of God's word. Kind of with the biblical archaeology and stuff like that, mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of seminary professors are kind of anti-biblical archaeology because I think they're pushing against this a posteriori idea. Like they don't need right. they they want to focus on Christ. That's right. And so because of that, they're they, I've got the sense a lot of them push. But that confirmation, 
you know, of that establishment is still very beneficial it to is. a lot of Christians. It is. And this is, it's, I, I make a similar kind of argument with apologetics. So apologetics, I think, are worthless as far as bringing somebody into the faith. But apologetics are extremely valuable for somebody who's in the faith, who ha wants to be confirmed in his faith and to be built up and realize, I don't have to be an idiot to follow Christ. And so apologetics are good. I think the same thing holds here with the a posteriori stuff. So you can show, that's where you buy your books from the event, evangelicals. They crank these books out like crazy. Why you should believe the Bible? Well, those things in there are, are true for the most part and are useful and they're helpful. And I wouldn't forbid my people to read them, but that's not where you start. That becomes, that comes later. And I, I'd agree with you. We don't need to be afraid of those kinds of things, but we need to make sure they stay in the right place. Yeah, good. Okay, good. <clears throat> he makes the comment also that um, if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't accept part of the Bible, just leave that part out. You've got other sources. That's kind of my whole argument with the end of Mark and with Second Peter. Same kind of thing. And I would agree with that. And you got this, this great Luther quote on 243. Just such, such good stuff from Luther. About halfway through. Uh, this judgment Luther also applies to the historical trustworthiness of Scripture in all cases where there is a discrepancy between secular writers and the statements of Scripture. He says, I make use of the secular writings in such a manner that I am not forced to contradict Scripture. For I believe that in the Scriptures the God of truth speaks. In the histories, good people display according to their ability their diligence and fidelity, but only as men, or at least that their copyists have perchance erred. And likewise, Luther maintains the inerrancy of the scriptures. Then he writes this next part. When Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and all that is therein in six days, then let us stand that it was in six days. And you dare not find a gloss how six days were one day. And if you cannot understand how it could have been done in six days, then accord the Holy Ghost the honor that he is more erudite than you. Um, you know, you, you got to like that. And that, frankly, this is where I've come down in the whole creation thing. Six days, fine. You know, I'll just take God at his word and... It can all get sorted out later. I'm not too concerned about that anymore. All right, good. I think that's on track for the most part there. Um, then Pieper starts getting a little odd again, though, because he, he's pretty sensitive to any charges of, like, bad grammar in the, in the Bible. He, he don't like that very much. And, in fact, Pieper insists there is no bad grammar. Because, see, that would imply that somehow the Holy Spirit doesn't know grammatical rules. And he's really uncomfortable with that. And so he, he tries to push hard. No, there are no grammatical mistakes, and it's okay, and there are no barbarisms in, in the text. So then he goes first to the, this is, he goes first to the first problem he's going to address. He's got his list of problems why people attack the idea that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. So the first attack is, even the new T writers don't quote the OT the right way. Remember that? So how does people respond to that one? What's he say, Josh? One thing he said was that uh, by kind of changing the OT, they're actually establishing authority over the Yes! Way. This is a classic peeper flip. I love this. And he's, he's playing the yeah. judo flip game. And so, and this is so classic peeper. It just cracks me up when he does this. This is the bottom of 250 to 251. So he says, the form of the OT quotations as given the new T does, not, does therefore not prove fatal to the theory of verbal inspiration, but is on the contrary a mighty proof of inspiration. You know, this is just classic peeper flip. Because here's the argument. Look, the new T writers are misquoting the Old Testament. Peeper says, what do you mean they're misquoting the Old Testament? Well, they're not getting it verbatim from the, old, from the Hebrew. Well, in fact, what that proves is not a lack of inspiration, but divine inspiration because only the Holy Spirit himself would be free to change the text. That's his argument. That's his argument. And it's like, people are like, ha, gotcha. And, he just, and it's like, ah, oh, Francis, you're killing me. You're just, you're just killing me. <laughs> it just cracks me up. But the, the, the real point is, and this is fine, in other words, the New T writers are pulling stuff out of the OT, and sometimes it doesn't agree with the Hebrew. And sometimes it doesn't even agree with the Septuagint. So what does this mean? This just means they're quoting from memory. And maybe they quote wrongly. Oh, no, it's not inspired. No, it's absolutely inspired. Holy Spirit inspired him to quote wrongly. Is that because he's changing the text? No, because the gist of the text is coming through and we're everything, everything's fine here. There's no foul. Quit all, getting all worked up. Herman has a, a different explanation on this. Okay, what's well, uh, his? He actually points out to secular writings and how it was actually frowned upon to quote it exactly. Oh, okay. You were supposed to quote it in a way that showed you knew and understood it and the sense of it 
but better than what the original. Oh, okay. To show your advance. Yeah, so it's showing that you actually knew it, Grasped not it. that you quoted verbatim. That wasn't true learning. That was just, just parroting me memory. Good. Okay, I like that, and that that would resonate very well with. I think other things. So that's good. Um, so then we go into, um, let's see, yeah. Then the next criticism is the Bible deals with too many trivialities. And God doesn't care about trivial things. And here the answer from Luther is really quite good. Um, this is on 253 into 254. And we get this idea that, now come on, if you're going to say that the Bible doesn't give trivial things, you're missing the whole point. It's all about the trivial. It's all about swaddling clothes. It's all about your life. It's all about the minutia. This is the stuff that matters. God gives a rip about it all. So that's kind of, I think that's a really nice touch, and that's pretty cool. So that, that's really well said, and I think that's quite on track. And then we go to the grammar thing, and he, he insists, this is bottom of 255 to 256. The New Testament is written, he's quoting some dude, Quenstead, I think. The New Testament is written in correct Greek and observes the Greek grammar. Whoever tests the new tea in this respect will agree with, oh, Weiner. But also the wild talk of barbarisms make no sense. So he's really reluctant to agree that there's any, you know, bad grammar. But if you've read, you know, the Apo Apocalypse of John, John might not be bad grammar, but it's really simplistic. And even some of it gets like, you know, a little bit iffy. And then he starts talking about the Anacoluthans, where, um, where you have, you know, a sentence starts and then kind of drops off and never finishes. And it just drives you nuts when you're trying to translate this stuff. So like in Romans 5, you have the classic one where Paul starts by saying, you know, he's going to talk about the law, and he's, he starts, uh, starts in uh, a protasis, but he never finishes it. He, he gets sidetracked, and he goes off into sidetrack, and then he puts a period, and he starts a new thought. I think, Paul, what are you doing here? And what's evident is that when he's, he's dictating and he's, doing his, he's writing this letter, he's just kind of getting caught in the moment cranks this idea out, and then there I got that one done, and off he goes. And his poor Manumentus is left trying to figure out how to put a period and go on, you know, and, and just leave it. And now, Peeper would argue, see, and that's exactly how the Holy Spirit wanted it, and I would say the same. But, you know, to say, well, and this is clearly intentional by Paul because he's trying to make a point. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe Paul just lost track of his grammar. Does that diminish the authority of the text? Not the least. Does it diminish the inspiration of the text? Not in the least. And so I would argue, can the Holy Spirit even inspire bad grammar? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. It's the, it's the whole idea of the human part coming through. What's the big deal? Isn't it just uh, the, own, the Holy Spirit using the, the human himself and his own personality and his writing style? Exactly. Exactly. This is exactly the point. And see, what is going on here is these both aspects. Now, Peeper says, we can't lose the divine. Got to stress this. Got to stress this. I get this. But I'm saying back to him, don't lose the human. They're both things. Keep them both going here. Dwight. The CTCR doctor mentioned something about intellects. Like, if you have a meaning you're trying to bring out that soup that's more important than the grammar, then you throw the grammar out. We keep the idea. Actually, it's Peeper who talks about this in the Anacoluthan. Yeah, right. But that's what he's getting at. So in other words, we're, it's, it's an intentional thing. And yeah, sometimes it can be an intentional thing. And other times maybe it's just he gets kind of wrapped up in the, his argument and off he goes. So either way, it's fine. But you're right. Well, the thing that people are screaming too is language is a divine invention. Grammar is a human invention. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the soul, yeah, it's a human invention. It's cool. All right, good, and then we move on. Um, then Peeper, he gets a little embarrassed when um, Paul uses some humor. And just catch us on 262. It's almost like embarrassing to think that Paul would have, you know, cracked a joke with Philemon. And so this is 262, and he's, uh, Alex. so he's got here, um, Paul, you know, this is about, 10 lines down. Paul unites the two kinds of love that assumes the other's burdens when he writes, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering. Ephesians 5. If we were to call what Paul says concerning the transfer of debt humor, which is not worthy of the Holy Ghost, we would be passing a judgment which does not flow from the knowledge which is of God. What? So God can't have a sense of humor? I, I have a trouble with that. And then, okay, well, we got that. Well, then you have like Galatians 5, where you got Paul who writes, um, but if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross would have, has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Now, what's that? You know, a little sarcasm, a little 
You know, the Holy Spirit can be nasty. No, that's kind of beneath it. So in other words, these are very human things. And when Paul says to Philemon, hey, just put it on my tab. <laughs> You're like, I'll ever pay you back? Ha! You know, what a joke that is. You know, come on, give me a break. Paul has no tab. And, it's, and is Paul twisting Philemon's arm? Clearly. Clearly. And you get the same thing in 2 second, in second Corinthians, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians about, hey, you know, don't embarrass me to those Macedonians. I've been bragging about you guys. Don't put me to shame. You know, what is that? You know? And so these are very human things, and there's a sense of a uh, little sarcasm that comes through. And even you have Jesus, you know, who has, you know, if you think sarcasm is being nasty, well, Jesus would never be nasty. But there are some things, you know, you know, whitewashed sepulchers, you know, and there are some things that come through with a little, you know, what for what, you know, so you, the, you smack me, for what wrong are you hitting me? You know, is that sarcasm? Or is he asking a legitimate question? For why are you hitting me? You know, or is there a little, or is there an edge to it? We don't know because you don't get to hear him say it. But it sure smells like sarcasm to me. And see, again, this makes people uncomfortable because that's just so human. But that's the whole point. It's human. And it's okay. It's okay because we hold them together.